All right. I titled this this morning's message, There's No Place Like Home. Um, And we're out of Psalms 91. (laughs) Well, I'm going to preach verses 1 through 4, but let's go ahead and just read. Let's go ahead and just read the whole psalm because it's really not very long. So we're going to read Psalm chapter 91. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you shall dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shall you trample under feet. It's talking about some type of a serpent, a sea creature. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. You know, this psalm is talking about a lot of bad things going on, you know, all around you, even to the point where people are falling at your left side, people are falling at your right side, but that the Lord promises that he's going to protect those that belong to him, his children, that that the people of God, the children of God aren't going to uh, see the reward of the wicked because what they are, they belong to the Lord. Amen. And what's going on is, is that because they've made a choice to live in a certain place. Repeatedly in this psalm is the idea of living in a certain place, deciding to make the presence of God, the children of God's habitat, their dwelling place, the place where they choose to dwell or live their life. And that's really why I titled it this morning's message, There's No Place Like Home. You know, the word psalm by itself, I, I kind of like to, to, to learn a lot of different things. And the word psalm is used in the Old Testament, but it's used also in the New Testament. And in both places, both in the Greek and the Hebrew, the idea behind the word means the same thing. It talks about the striking of strings. So it's kind of like the idea of a musical instrument uh, that's played with the fingers. So during these times, they didn't really have guitars, but they had a harp or something also known as a lyre, L-Y-R-E, which was a small harp. And so a psalm describes the stroking or the, the, the plucking of strings, the hitting of strings to make a musical melody that can be accompanied by lyrics. In other words, it's a sound of music that flows well with lyrical or word accompaniment. Does that make sense? Because you see, words are important. And it's the words in a psalm or a song that give praise to the Lord. I, I could say a whole lot more about lyric, about melodies and modern music and all that, but I don't really want to get into all that this morning. And what I want you to know is, is that a psalm is a spiritual song that, that, that has a melody and has connected to it words. And the words ultimately give praise to the Lord. Ultimately, when you think about the book of Psalms, if you read about Psalms. It's spelled kind of funny. I heard one old boy, I'm just kind of like, want y'all to know in case y'all ever talk to somebody out on the street about Psalms. I want you to know how to pronounce it. It's got a P in the front. P 
S A L M S. You probably already knew how to pronounce it, but one old boy was <laughs> sharing the scripture with me. He said, The book of Palms. It's not Palms, it's Psalms. All right. I just, hey, look, you never know. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there so that you so that you know. But when I think of the book of Psalms, I automatically think of King David. Because many of the songs are credited to him. The idea is that he wrote these psalms. We, we know if you look back, you can see it with evidence within some of the psalms that many of them were probably written by him when he was a young teenage boy caring for the flocks of his father's sheep in a pasture. So he's over there learning how to play this lyre or harp, this stringed instrument. And he's, and he's learning the process of putting the music together with the words. He's out there by himself with him and the Lord. And he's building a relationship with God. Now, one thing that I will tell you, I'm just talking a little bit about David this morning. Because we don't even know for sure that David wrote this. I'm just talking about him just for a second. One thing that we know that David also learned, he wasn't just learning how to play a guitar. Because I don't know how a guitar makes you feel. You know, <laughs> there, I did think of a funny story that I don't think I've ever told you all <laughs> There was a time whenever my dad, my dad grew up, man, his, his dad, was, my dad was pretty tough, but his dad was even worse, according to the way he describes the story. And he had about six brothers, and he said they would always, under the house, doing something they weren't supposed to do. And he said one day my daddy reached under there, and he snatched the first one he could get a hold of. He said, hey, boy, you're going to take some guitar lessons, because they had this guy that was coming around selling guitar lessons. And he goes, and so he said, I'm going to pay this money. And then, you know, at the end, he was supposed to be able to play a song. And so he said that every week his daddy would give him, it seemed like everything cost two bits, which was a quarter back in those days. But for two bits, you could go down to the picture show. So he said that every week his daddy would give him two bits. He'd sneak out the back and he'd go to the picture show instead. He said then the day of reckoning it came and it was time for her. He said, okay, boy, you've been taking them guitar lessons. I want you to play me a song. <laughs> My daddy said, boy, I was trying to strum that guitar. And he said, anyway, he said, I couldn't play a song to save my life. And my daddy was so bad, he put a whooping on me that day. Anyway, it made me think of that. What David was doing, though, he was using his time wisely. He was out there in that pasture. He was learning how to play that guitar. Because, see, I think the reason that made me think of that is because I don't think that my daddy thought that playing a guitar was probably something that a tough person in his mind would do. But let me just tell you something. Young David's out there playing that harp, and he's learning about a strength that most tough guys on this earth will never understand or know about because he's making a spiritual connection with the God of glory, with the God of heaven. And he wasn't just out there learning how to play a guitar. It's also probably the place, we don't know for certain, but it's also the place where he probably learned how to, how to sling those rocks out of that slingshot. It's also the place where he learned how to combat both bears and lions with his own bare hands and gain the victory. But he never learned how to take the victory for or the glory for himself. Instead, each and every time that he won a battle, he realized it was the Lord that was his strength. It was the Lord that was his power and he gave glory to God. So the point that I guess I'm trying to make is, is that, and then even after he became king, most of the Psalms, if you read through the Psalms, it'll say, the chief musician of David, even after he became king and he was a man of great notoriety and he might not have even had to play time to play the harp as much as what he did, maybe only in times whenever he just had a moment in time to get along with the Lord. I don't really know, but I do know this. He made great strides and efforts in his kingdom to make sure that musical Praise to God was a very important part of his kingdom. He developed a whole class of musicians that would that was what they did. They wrote psalms to the Lord and they worshiped God. It was very important to David. Now, in this particular psalm, we don't know really who wrote it. It's not attributed. There, it wasn't signed by an author. Some scholars believe that it may have actually been written by Moses because Moses wrote the one before it. And we know that. And one thing that I will tell you is it doesn't really matter whether it's Moses or David. Both of them had experienced things in their life. They had gone through things. You know, Moses had led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years. The children of Israel didn't want to be in the wilderness. But it was their own fault they were in the wilderness. They had made decisions and choices in their own life that caused them to continue to wander in a wilderness instead of entering into the promised land which God had for them. And I got to tell you that the same truth still holds for us today. The, it's the choices that we make, the decisions that we make that oftentimes cause us to find ourselves in certain situations and circumstances. It's not always our choices and decisions. 
Sometimes it's other people's choices and decisions. In reality, Moses did his own share a couple of times of failing the Lord. But in reality, it wasn't really Moses that didn't want to trust God to bring them into the promised land. It was the children of Israel. Joshua wanted to trust God to bring him in. He was like a bulldog. That's what his name means, dog. He had tenacity. He didn't want to quit. He just wanted to fight. Him and Caleb, I'm sorry, Caleb's name means that. Yeshua means God is our salvation. Joshua and Caleb wanted to fight and trust God, but because of the report of the other ones, they weren't able to enter into the promised land. So the point is, is that whether it's your choice or somebody else's choices in life, many times, even though you're the child of God and you love the Lord, you're going to find yourself in circumstances and situations that things aren't always going your way. Can I get an amen? That's right. And so in the middle of all of that, we see that we will face these times, but we also need to understand that God has a plan and God has a purpose. Amen. And he has a promise. And I think that we're going to see within this psalm some promises that, that, that should be refreshing. Now, Charles Spurgeon was an old preacher back in the late 1800s. And he was, a, he was very eloquent with his words. But he said this. I'm not really going to talk a whole lot about sickness. But whether it be physical sickness, whether it be emotional sickness, whether it be spiritual sickness. You know, the enemy wants to destroy you one way, shape, or form. But this is what Spurgeon said about Psalm 91. He said, in the whole collection, there is not a more cheering psalm. Its tone is elevated and sustained throughout. Faith is at its best and speaks nobly. He said this, a German physician was wont to speak of it as the best preservative in times of cholera. That was an old illness that we don't really see anymore. And in truth, it is a heavenly medicine against plague and pest. He who can live in his spirit will be fearless. I want you to think about that. He who can live in the spirit of Psalm 91. Which, what I need you to understand is, is that every situation that you face in life when the enemy comes against you is going to do everything that it can to pull you out of the spirit of what this psalm is speaking. The, 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 the content, the, the idea that there, there's a certain place that is produced that is available because of God and his plan where God wants you to stay. But the enemy's going to do everything that he can to pull you out of this place. Oh, yeah. and, and, and for this physician, he was saying that even if another cholera epidemic takes place, he goes on to say this, he who can live in his spirit will be fearless. Even if once again London should become a Lazar house, short for Lazarus, the house of Lazarus, death abounds. And the grave be gorged with carcasses. I can think really of probably no greater fear that a physician might have as if a whole city be, be you know, facing a plague and carcasses lie everywhere. And, and you're over here trying to help people, fearful that the same plague would maybe jump on you. But what he's saying is, is that even within this psalm, what, what a wonderful day it must have been when physicians trusted in the word of the Lord. To be able to live in the spirit of Psalm 91. Where God communicates that there's hope and that there's grace and that there's strength. And that even though you see a thousand fall at your left and ten thousand fall at your right. If you will trust me, if you will live in this place, it shall not come near your dwelling place. Yes. Amen. Point number one. There is a place that he has prepared. In, voice, in verse number one, he says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high. It's a secret place. You know, the world can't see this place because they're not looking for it. This is a spiritual place that can only be found by faith. And God responds to faith. Right. And he reveals himself to faith. If you look at Exodus 33, starting in verse 16, I always thought when I began to think about the secret place. Let me just tell you a little quick story. When I, when I first got saved, I was, very, I was very carnal, to make this quick, meaning I was very fleshly, I was very worldly. Even after I got saved, when I first heard Christian music, I was like, man, this does sound so lame compared to the, that's just how my mindset was. You understand what I'm saying? Because the world had had such an influence on me. In my mind, I was convinced that what the world offered and what the way that the world looked was cool and that the way that Christianity was or looked was lame or whatever I was thinking in my mind because I was all perverted in my way of thinking I had been influenced 
by the, by the ways of the world. This, this stayed with me for quite some time. And, and don't get me wrong, I want you to know that I was, it was legitimate when I got saved. Like I really did not want to continue to live the life that I had previously lived. That I genuinely wanted to be a child of God and I did everything that I knew to do. I would go into the house of God. I, I even looked, they told me I needed to pay my tithes. I would pay my tithes even though I wasn't always happy about it. I just tried to do what it was that they told me to do, but I didn't know anything else of what I was supposed to do on my own because I had not really learned the ways of God. I wouldn't go the extra mile. I wouldn't go to Sunday school to learn a little bit more. I was just too tired. And you know what? At least I was going to church and, and, and that was good enough. I, but I, And I never really learned how to access the presence of God. I never really learned how to, how to get into this place where I really experienced. I, don't get me wrong. Corporately in the church, I had felt the presence of God move in services. But as far as for at my house, I never really took the time to seek God on my own, in, in, in my own home or whatever. And it's not that I never prayed outside of church. I would say prayers, you know, if I was going through something, I needed something, I would go to the Lord. And I can remember there was one time I felt like when I was early on in our, mar in our marriage that the Lord was drawing me to seek his face. We lived in this little trailer. And I'm just being honest with you that I got up early that morning and I said, maybe I'm up because God's been telling me to go seek him. And so I went into the living room and I knelt down at the couch and all of a sudden I felt this palpable presence of evil. I'm just being honest with you. I felt this presence of evil that was so strong and I always prided myself on really not being scared. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I'm gonna, look, it, got, it, 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 it freaked me out to the point where I'm like, well, I guess maybe I wasn't supposed to do this. And I went back into the bed and I went back to sleep. And that kept me, I don't know that I was stricken with so much fear, but I was already kind of lackadaisical towards seeking God. But that right there was enough to prevent me from really going after the face of God for probably another 11 years. Until there was a day whenever trial and tribulation happened, and I can remember that the Lord had been moving upon my heart. I'm trying to talk to you about a spiritual secret place real quick before we get into the text. When I had been going through some things that I had never really learned how to truly pray on my own. I'd heard how other people prayed. I had never really learned how to access God on my own or how to experience the presence of God for myself. I really hadn't. After 12 years of being a Christian, but then some things that happened in my life and I became desperate and I could hear the voice of God speaking to my heart saying, seek me and you shall find me. Seek me early. But I, I don't want to get up early, Lord. I don't like the morning time. I'm not a morning person. I don't want to get up. Seek me early and you shall find me. I'm not trying to say that you make a law out of it getting up early in the morning. But for me, the Lord knew, no, you want to find me, you're going to get up early because that's where I will be. And finally, one morning, it was almost like maybe again, he was, I don't know that God, I'm sure he has much more patience than I do, but he woke me up again. Right. That morning, in a place of desperation, in a place of pain, in a place of brokenness, I cried out to the Lord. And I felt God's presence in a way like I had never felt it before. Yeah. I've shared the story with y'all before. The point that I'm trying to make, though, is this, is that at every morning from that day forward for several months, I would get up earlier and earlier and earlier. And it's almost like because I was tapping into something that I didn't even know existed. It was like it was right there the whole time. And I was just missing it by a, by a spiritual inch. It was all around me. And all I had to do was step into it. It, and when I would step into it, I was finding a level of grace, a level of, 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 of strength that I didn't even know existed. It was like the more tired I was in the physical, the more powerful I was in the spiritual. I would be so worn out. The next thing you know, I'd be at work and somebody would actually open up a door because God, I was realizing, man, God, you open up doors all the time. And, and as soon as I would say the name Jesus, all of a sudden I'd be reinvigorated. I'd be full of, of the energy of God. And it was like, who cares about sleep? I started thinking, man, sleep is very overrated. Yes. The presence of God is what I need. That's right. I didn't know anything about the message of the cross then. God was bringing me to the message of the cross. He was bringing me to the book of Romans. He was help, causing me to focus on the cross. You know why? I'm, I'll tell you this. Before you know it, I started putting my faith in getting up earlier. Right. Yeah. It's got to be a balance, folks. Jesus died so that we could get into that secret place. See, that's what happened. 
I started seeing places in the scripture as I started reading. I was like, this is the secret place. This is the place that God's talking about. It's a place of special relationship with him. A place where I can live. A place where I can abide. A place where I can dwell. And the only reason, and then once I understood the message of the cross, I realized that the only reason I can access the secret place, the only reason that God will even allow me in that place where his presence dwells is because of what Jesus did for me at Calvary. And the great exchange took place where he took my sin upon him and he gave me his righteousness. And now now if I will stay in a moment of faith, if I will stay in a position of faith where I understand he is my righteousness. I'm not going to access the presence of God based upon my own merit. I'm not going to access the presence of God because I got up at 430 instead of 7 o'clock. I'm not, listen to me, if I get up at 815 and I'm running late, I'm still in Christ spiritually. But if I want, but the only way that I'm going to be able to feel the presence of God, experience the presence of God it, on a continuous basis and the reason that I can is because of what Jesus did yes. at the cross. Amen. He set me free. Amen. He clothed me with his righteousness and because of that I have access Amen. to the presence of God. I can get into the secret place. Yes. Look at Exodus chapter 33 verses 16 through 23. We're talking about Moses right here. He says, for wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? See, God told Moses, listen, I'm about to use you. I'm about to use you. I'm going to deliver my people. I'm going to bring them into the promised land, and you're going to lead them. And Moses is saying, how is it that we're going to be able to find grace in your sight? Is it not in that you go with us? In other words, we need your presence with us. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. What makes us different than everybody else, Lord? And you're gonna, you're calling me out. You're telling me that I'm going into a new place of uncertainty, a place that I'm not used to being, a place that I've never been before. I don't know what awaits me over there. How in the world are we going to be any different than the world around us if you're not with us? Yes. You're what makes us different, God. Still today for you, New Testament Christian, the reason that you're different than the world around you is because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Right. If you thought it was because you were doing everything right and you were going to church and you were reading your Bible and now you gave your heart to Jesus, that's a lie from the devil. No, it's because Jesus died to set you free. And when you put faith in that, guess what? The Holy Spirit moved into your heart. Yes. And now you're different. You're separated from the world. Amen. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. And he said, I beseech you. Show me your glory. Moses said, I'm begging you, Lord. Okay, you're saying, you're saying all this. I now want you to show me your glory. I want you to show me who you are. I really want to understand your character. I really want to know you, God, in a way like I've never known you before. Let me see you, Lord. Amen. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. Thank you, Lord, for making yes. a place by you, Lord. Thank you for, for preparing a place yes. where we can get close to you. He said, there's a place by me. He says, and you shall stand upon a rock. You know, God in the New Testament wants you and I to understand that he's given us a rock. The rock's name is Jesus. Yeah. The Apostle Paul said it, that there was a rock that the children of Israel sought after. And from that rock flowed water, yeah. water like grace. Amen. And grace flowed from that rock. His name is Jesus. Then the Lord told Moses, you're going to stand on that rock and it shall come to pass. While my glory passes by, then I will put you in a cliff in the rock. I'm going to stick you in a crevice, Moses. I'm going to put you in a crevice, in a secret place in that rock. And it's only in this place that you're going to be able to see me. He said, I will cover you with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. I'm going to show you everything that I can show you, Moses. You want to see my glory? You want to understand really who I am? I'm going to put you in a special place, a protected place. I'm going to put my hand over you to, to, to protect you. But listen, you want to see everything you want to see? Well, this is the place that you're going to have to be in order to see it. New Testament Christian, i got to tell you something, that there's a, a place known as in Christ. And in that secret place, you and I can access the presence of God. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. What's going to make us different than the rest of the people 
It says, I'm going to put you in a secret place where I can re reveal myself to you. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.7. It's a secret place. See, not everybody can see it because the world's not really even looking for it. Come on now. 1 Corinthians 2.7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The Apostle Paul calls the wisdom of God a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. The Apostle Paul saying, I've been called by the Lord to speak forth the mysteries of God, to expound upon the things that have been hidden from the ages, that God has desired to reveal himself to sinful man. And these mysteries have been hidden, but now they are found in Christ. And God has called me to teach the, those that are lost so that they might know how they can access the grace of God, the presence of God, how they can enter into this place where they can learn the mysteries of God. It's a secret place, but it's also a place to live. That's what the word said. It says, he that dwelleth in the secret place. The word dwelleth means to sit down, to remain, to settle, to abide, to continue. It means that you're going to move in somewhere, you know. A lot of times in the Old Testament, sometimes you'll see, then the narrative will say, and he planted a tree. You, you don't typically plant a tree unless you plan on staying Amen, somewhere right. for a while. You know, you typically if you're moving in maybe into an apartment somewhere and you don't plan on staying for a while, you probably won't hang a whole lot of pictures on the wall. The idea is, is that what he's talking about here is that I want to bring you to a place, but you're going to have to dwell there. You're going to have to make this place your home. I was having a conversation with somebody this morning and I was saying, you know, sometimes we face things in life. No, a lot of times, all the time we face things in life. We find ourselves in the midst of a struggle. But, you know, one of the things that I've come to the conclusion of and this, I don't know how you're going to take this, but I'm just going to be real with you is that I've come to the conclusion that guess what? I want to live for the Lord. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is I don't want to live in the world anymore. I've drank all I want to drink. I've done all the worldly things that I want to do. I'm not trying to say that the enemy will never try to come back at me with any type of temptation. He's always trying to trip me up. But what I'm trying to tell you is I am convinced in my spirit, man, that I don't want to live there anymore. And that instead I want to be a servant of the Most High God. Yes, amen. I realize that, that no matter what I face in life, no matter how bad it is, what my spirit man wants is to serve the Lord. Yes. It's to be a follower of Jesus. I don't want to turn my back on the Lord. Amen. He never turned his back on me. Amen. He, he was faithful to the end. Yes. He never quit. Praise God for his perseverance. Yes. Praise God that he kept going. Hallelujah for his strength. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's a place that I gotta live. Jesus said in John 15 that you're he says, You're the vine, I'm the you're the branch, I'm the vine. He that abides in me will bear much fruit. Abide, dwell, the same concept, a place to live. Well, you and I are gonna have to learn how to stay connected to Jesus yes. by faith. Yes. Have you been convinced this morning that you want to live for the Lord? Amen. Yes. I didn't ask you if you were convinced that you wanted to be religious. Right. I didn't ask you if you were convinced that you wanted to come to church. I asked if you were convinced that you wanted to be a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom of God. Because if that is what you come to the conclusion of, then guess what? You're going to be willing to be open. You're going to be willing to allow your heart and your mind to hear the word of God and come to the conclusion that God's citizens live their lives a certain way, whereas the citizens of the world live their lives a certain way. And you're going to be asking for grace in order to make it look the way that it's supposed to look. Amen. Help us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So it's a place to live, Acts 17, 28. When we're in this place, look at what it says. I love these prepositional phrases. I'm not going to write it on the board, but look. For in him. How many times have I talked about I feel like writing it. I'm just going to tell you about it. So imagine it in your mind. Quotation, open quote. In him, close quote. It's called a prepositional phrase. Preposition in. Him is a subject. It's in a place. See, when you put faith in Christ, the old man that you were died, he was buried, and, and he resurrected to a new place. 
It's kind of like Moses was put in the cleft of a rock. When you died in Christ, you were put in him. It's a new place. In him we live and move and have our being is certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. You know what the context here is, is that the Apostle Paul is traveling across the Mediterranean Sea and he ends up in Greece. And he ends up in this place in Athens, Greece. And there's this hill. It's still there today. You can Google it. I don't, you can even do it right now while I'm talking to you. It's called Mars Hill. You can Google Mars Hill. It's still there. It's another name of it was the Areopagus. And it was where all the Greek philosophers of that day would get up on this hill and they would just espouse all their philosophy and all their human intellect. Well, it seems as though paved, I haven't been there, so I don't know if they're still there or not, but it seems as though the road to the Areopagus was paved, the road to Mars Hill was paved with all of these various gods that were on both sides of the road. The Apostle Paul, as he's walking by, is looking at the names of these different gods. And he tells them when he gets up on Mars Hill, he guess it's his time. You know, all these Greek philosophers have done their talking, and now it's his, he waits his turn, and he gets, he gets up there, and he begins to say... I want to talk to you about the God that you have inscribed that says to the unknown God. Because you got every other God and he hasn't been doing anything for you. So I'm kind of giving him, speaking for him a little bit here. But I want to talk to you about that one that you don't know. I want to talk to you about that one God that you haven't met yet. The one that if you would meet him, you would find out that everything that you're looking for, if you could be found in him, you would find the actual meaning of life. Hallelujah. Because in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. He even quoted that came out of one of their own poets from Greece. He, he, he quoted a word that, that the Lord told him, use some of their own language so that they can make a connection. You've been looking on how you could live. You've been looking on how you would find the movement because the word movement there actually describes real life, true life. Because you know what? Something that's dead isn't moving. And he says, and have your being. Go ahead and say that word to them, Paul, because they'll understand. And tell them about this God that they don't know of because I want to have a relationship with them. And the terminology of life there describes true life. You know, just because you have air in your lungs and blood in your veins doesn't mean that you're really living. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life. And to have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Listen, when you're looking for real life, it can only be found in Christ. And when you find the life that Christ offers, then there's movement connected to it. Now, movement that looks different than the movement that you used to move around, right? It's a movement that looks like the things of God, the kingdom of God. And it's also where we have our being. And the idea of being there describes a place of real hope. Real hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everything that man builds his life upon that is not upon the foundation, which is Christ Jesus, is like building your life on shifting sand. Yes. I love going to the beach. One of the things that I've noticed whenever I go to the beach, if I just stand right there, I don't do it a whole lot, but if I just stand right there where the waves are breaking, whenever the wave comes over my feet and it comes back, it's just pulling sand out from underneath my feet. You ever notice that? I'm kind of a heavy fella and still I can feel my body moving. Because sand shifts. The rock doesn't shift. The rock is immobile. The rock stays secure. It stays firm. Amen. And I'm just here to tell you that in this place, the world begins to make sense. The world is constantly moving. The world is constantly changing. And whenever people build their life upon what the world offers, they're constantly running after the newest and the greatest and the latest fad. You know why? Because they're left empty. on. The, I'm talking about people in the church this morning. Found empty on the inside. Oh, I got to find the next thing that's going to bring me fulfillment. I got to find the next thing that's going to bring me happiness. What is it now that my money can buy? What is it now that I can turn my attention to? And time and again, if it's not the Lord, it's only going to leave me empty. Listen, we in him, we have our being. It's a place where real hope comes clear. It's a place where the world actually begins to make some sense. Hallelujah. If you stay in it a little bit more, a little bit longer. That was point number one. It's a place. It's a place to live. It's a place that he's prepared. Point number two. This place is a place of safety. He said... I will say of the Lord, 
He is my refuge and my fortress. A fortress is a place of safety. When you look it up in the original language, it's a place of safety for when you're being hunted. I mean, I could imagine that more than likely it was taught. Maybe they had a deer in mind. I don't know. The psalmist also talked about as the heart or the deer panteth after the water brook. So my soul longs after you, O Lord. Maybe he imagined a deer running in the forest and the hunter was chasing him. And the deer actually was able to find a place that was a fortress. But the idea is a safety when being hunted and a refuge is a shelter from a storm. I preach a lot about storms, but you know, I knew I was in good place this morning with my message whenever Naya mentioned the storms of life in her music. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I know I'm not teaching you something new with that verse this morning, but I do need you to get another revelation of it. I need you to be reminded of it because we got short term memory problem in the church. We oftentimes forget what the word of God says and what we learned last week. We don't hold on to it like we ought to. So I'm going to remind you this morning that you're not wrestling against real people. Sometimes it appears that way. I'm talking about the fact that you need a fortress. Because you're being hunted. You're being hunted by the enemy of your soul. He roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's what the scripture says. He's looking for a weak spot. He's looking for any kind of way that he can get in there and bring destruction in your life. Right. You know, Peter said, don't find it. Why are you so amazed when you find yourself in the midst of a fiery trial? Why, why were you so surprised when you got hit by this thing? Was it because it got, you got blindsided? Well, then you just weren't staying focused. Listen to me. The enemy, though, he does use people. But your fight is not with the people. Amen. Someone you love, a spouse, a family member, a church friend, someone you work with. Or just some acquaintance is being used by a vessel of the spirits of darkness. Words that cut and tear and hurt. Listen to me. Sometimes <clears throat> the people that we feel the fight coming against us with. Sometimes they have a right to do to bring some correction in our lives. Can I get, can I get an amen on that? Amen. Sometimes there's some things going on in our lives that aren't really right. And God will allow people to bring a certain level of correction in our lives. But can I also say this? And I hope that y'all are all with me. On <clears throat> There's many times that even whenever they do that, even if they know the Lord, they don't necessarily do it the way the Lord would have done it. Because they also have flesh. And they also, the enemy wants to use them as a vessel through which he can cause confusion and frustration. Because ultimately, he's on the hunt. Right. He's like a lion on the prowl and he wants to destroy you and he wants to bring pain into your life and he wants to get you frustrated to the point where you say, you know what? These people say that they are this or they're that and then look at their life in reality they're not and the enemy wants to come in and he wants to cause bitterness to come into your heart. It's good. Right. It's good. The enemy's on the prowl. Right. He wants to destroy. You know, many times the only way I know how to describe it Humans, sometimes as humans, we have a thirst for the desires of the flesh. Mm. Come on, somebody, help me out here. You're not so holy that I can't speak truth to you, right? <laughs> we have a thirst for the desires of our flesh. The reason why we thirsty for our flesh to be satisfied is because it feels good. Have you ever experienced anything that wasn't of the Lord but felt good to your flesh? Right, right. I mean, I'm just being real with you. Sometimes just going to Dillard's at a sale and buying some new clothes <laughs> makes my flesh feel good. I know that's weird. I guess I'm more like a girl than a man. <laughs> Sometimes just spending money makes yeah. my flesh feel good. Yeah. And we don't have time to get into all the other things that can make our flesh feel good. Humans, souls, that's why people are thirsty for drugs and alcohol. That's why people are thirsty for lustful situations that cause their flesh to feel good. 
I was having that same conversation this morning with somebody. And, you know, many times when we find ourselves in the trials of life and things are going like in an opposite direction of where, of where we've been, we, rem we, re we reminisce about things in the past that made us feel good. You know what I'm saying? For, at least for a moment. And we have a temptation and a tendency to want to gravitate back towards that. The enemy is trying to pull us away. The enemy allows see God is more than more than willing to allow the trial or the or the tribulation to take place because his word is because see there's always a test taking place. There's always a test taking place because see God wants to test our faith. God wants to teach you something. He wants to teach me something. He wants to remind us that whenever you're going through something, going buy a new pair of pants at Dillard's ain't going to fix it. It might make you feel better for a day or two, but it's not going to fix it. Especially when you get the bill in. But the enemy, want, but, but what God wants to do is he wants to get us to the place where we come to the realization that, hey, I'm still here. Amen. I paid a high price so that you could enter into the secret place, a place where my presence is, a place where you can access me, a place where you can hear my voice and be strengthened in your time of need. When you come here, when you come and meet with me, when you come and spend time with me. So the enemy, listen, he wants to use people in your life. I'm talking about people, and I, but I also want to talk about circumstances, but I don't want to get off of people yet because <laughs> I want to make sure you understand what I'm trying to say. When you find yourself in situations in life and you feel as though you've been wrong, let me tell you something. I can do you so much. I can help you out so much and I'm going to keep my words simple. For the longest time as a person who used to do drugs and alcohol, every single time I found a situation in my life that went wrong, guess what? It was everybody else's fault. Everybody else's fault. It wasn't Matt's fault. But the reality of it is, and I hate to keep saying it, I showed up at my sister's house basically with rags on my back and not a penny in my pocket. And it wasn't nobody's fault but mine. Every decision and choice that I had made that led me down the pathway of where I ended up was because of me and what the choices that I was making. Listen to me, it's not always all your fault in every situation that you find yourself. But one thing that I've learned in life is this. When I find myself in a precarious circumstance, the first thing that I try to do, I'm like, Lord, please help me to remember to do this, is to look in the mirror. You understand what I'm getting at? When you find yourself in a situation that's uncomfortable, the first thing that you really should do, instead of looking at this one, instead of looking at that one, instead of looking at this, you should look at yourself in the mirror and say, all right, Lord. What are you wanting me to learn from this? Because I guarantee you, every time you face a situation, if you focus on that one, this one, and that one, you're never going to see what God wants you to see. And you're going to just stay blind in the same circumstance. And you're going to keep going through the same trial and tribulation time and again because God is trying to speak That's to you. Right. That's right. That's Amen. Amen. See, because if you can see what God wants you to see, you can actually pray that God would do a work in your own heart. Then you can turn around and you can pray. Can, can, I get in, can I get a witness in here that it's not the Lord? If somebody's coming against you and the way you used to handle things was to, was to punch them in the jaw, to clip them on the jaw and make them go take a nap. Can I tell you that that's not the way that you're supposed to do that today? Once you come into Christ. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make a point. That there's ways to remedy circumstances. And the ways that maybe we used to remedy circumstances, that's just one example to take matters into our own hands. But now the Lord would have you to do things differently, Amen. to put him in the battle. Dude, that's a hard thing. Yes, it is. That is a hard thing whenever I'm like, no, I can fix this, really. I can, I can, I can fix this. Trust me, it's not going to fix anything. It's not. It's just going to lead you down the same pathway and situation. You're not going to grow from it. You're not going to, you're not going to learn from it. The enemy wants to pull, more than anything, wants to pull you out the secret place. Wow. 
He wants to put you back in your old place. He wants you to live there. He wants you to, he don't want you, he doesn't want you to move forward. All right, that, that's enough for people. Listen, you're not battling against people. You're battling against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, and heavenly places. You're battling against something that you can't fight, dude. You'll wear yourself out shadow boxing against the forces of evil. You will be tired, you will be worn out, and you will not accomplish a thing. That's right. That's right. But also situations. Financial problems, problems at work, relationship issues. Yes, all these probably involve other human beings in some way, but sometimes it's the trial itself that seems to be the problem rather than the person. It's a storm and you need a refuge. That's what a refuge is. It's a shelter from the storm. In this place of safety that God has provided in Christ, there is grace and safety to protect you from the storm. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> even in this place, the waves may still rage, the winds may still howl, but God is able to say, peace, be still. Jesus spoke to the storm and it calmed. And as soon as God's ready for the storm to calm in your life, he can say, peace, be still to that situation. And, and he brings a peace that surpasses all understanding. That's a scripture out of Philippians. He brings a peace that surpasses all understanding. What, what does that even mean? It means that all kind of chaos and trouble could be going on around you and the situation still hasn't changed. Right. But when God injects his peace in the middle of it, the whole situation feels different yes. and you have a completely different perspective on it because God showed up in the middle of your situation yes. and your circumstance. The question is, though, will we turn to him? Will we choose to trust in him? Or will we seek another refuge in the midst of our storm? When the storm rages and you feel like you're on sinking sand, will you jump in another boat? Or will you remember that you chose to build your house on the rock? Amen. Stand and trust the Lord. That's what it says in Matthew 7, 24 through 25 about storms. It says... Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, talking about the word of God, and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Jesus is the rock, amen? amen. And the place that we're supposed to build our house is upon the rock. Yes. Point number three, this place gives wisdom. It says, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. A fowler was a bird hunter. And the way he caught his birds was in a trap. And when it comes to trapping wildlife, even though I really don't know anything about it, I really don't. I've known some trappers in my life. But I would imagine that there's all kinds of various types of bait and trap systems. Some very simple. Some very intricate. At the same time, they have something basic in common. Bait and snare. Bait and snare. The main point here is that Satan has a bait and a trap system and he won't typically change tactics as long as his old game is working. You know that? <laughs> That's right. He's not going to waste his energy because so oftentimes human beings are so <clears throat> naive. We'll just keep it sweet like that. Naive. I'm, look, I'm talking about myself. I can say, speak for myself. Dumb. Right, right. Keep falling into the same old trap. Bait, trap, bait, trap, bait, snare. He's not going to change his tactics. If he can keep us falling and failing with the same old bait and trap, then he will keep using the same old bait and trap. We need the wisdom of God to avoid the snare of the fowler. Each one of us have weak spots that we know exist in our lives. The enemy of our soul knows that those weaknesses are there also because he's the one that's been preying on them through the same old bait and trap for years. God wants to give us wisdom so that we will learn something new, a new path, a new response to an old test. 
See, that's why, let, let me tell you something. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say this the wrong way because I'm really not trying to make any enemies. I mean, I've never really been scared of that. I, unfortunately, my personality has been way too confrontational in the past and that's not what I'm trying to do. Honestly, I'm not. I just need you to know my heart. So I'm gonna try not to say it like the way I would, I would wanna say, I would probably, Matt's personality would say. But just think, and I don't want you to raise your hands, but think to yourself, how many times have you really gotten into the word of God this last week? Don't raise your hands. How many times have we really gotten into the Word of God this week? And no reason that I'm even bringing that up is because it's in the Word of God that the words of life are there. Yeah. Yes. So, so then when you think about the fact that we probably hadn't even gotten into the Word of the Lord that much this week, possibly. I'm not speaking for all of y'all because some of y'all might get up every morning, drink your coffee, and read your Word. Some people do that. And if that's you, then praise God. Amen? Amen. But if it's not you, then now we ought to be able to get a little bit of a revelation on why we ought to be in church at least a couple of times a week. Because at least we're getting a little bit of the Word of God. Now, praise God, you do have the opportunity to turn on a radio station. You can turn on Sun Life Radio and you can get the Word of God in your heart that way. Amen? On, on, a, on a continuous basis, praise God. And that's a good thing. Right? Get the Word of Life, Word of God in your heart. Some way, shape, or form. I wore out CDs, Bible on CD. Listening to it over and over and over again. Amen? To get the word of God in there. What I'm trying to talk to you about is wisdom. Wisdom for the bait, the, the bait and snare. So that, because if you don't know the word of God and you don't know the pathway of God and you don't have the wisdom of God, you know, wisdom starts with knowledge. I know I've taught on the Proverbs before, and I, but I love this concept that, that the wisdom of God and the understanding of God has to start with the knowledge of God. What I mean by knowledge is just simple instruction. Simply the word of God being exposed to it. Mm -hmm. If all of your life, all you were exposed to was the ways of the world and the instruction of the world, then when you find yourself in precarious situations, you're going to respond the way that the world taught you to respond. Right, right, is that right? Right. That's right? Clip them on the jaw, throw some money at it, whatever the case. But the reality of it is, is that as you begin to allow yourself, familiarize yourself with the knowledge of God, now you're beginning to learn a different pathway. You're beginning to learn the way that God would handle certain situations. Now, when you begin to take the knowledge of God and begin to apply it in situations and circumstances in life, it becomes wisdom. Wisdom is the application of God's knowledge. Godly wisdom is the application of God's knowledge. And guess what? When you begin to apply the wisdom of God in situations on a regular basis, you begin to have an understanding of the ways of God. Amen. You, can begin to, you begin to be able to see it. Oh, there's that bait. There's that bait again. There's that trap. There's that snare. I'm not going there. I'm not going to trigger the trap. I'm getting tired of my, my old ankle getting caught up in that thing. It hurts. When I get my ankle caught up in that thing. Wisdom for the path. Proverbs 12, 15 says this. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkens unto counsel is wise. The word hearkeneth means not only that your faculty of hearing is working, but that you also submit to the truth. See, a fool will continue walking in a direct direction towards a bait that has repeatedly snared him in the past. We all have had foolish tendencies at one point or another in our lives, but it's God's will that we would come to a place where we would allow his word to speak to us and change our direction. He wants to give us the wisdom that we need through his word to alert us to the trap that lies ahead on the road. But the truth is that many times we want what we want and we continue towards that bait that will ultimately lead to a snare in our lives. I'm just speaking truth to you this morning out of the word of the Lord. Next, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about wisdom to learn. I'm going to cut out point number four. So just bear with me. We're almost done. Wisdom to learn to love the ways of God. Amen. Proverbs 12, 1. Whoso loves instruction, loves knowledge, but he that hates reproof is brutish. You know that word brutish? I looked it up in a couple of other translations. It really means stupid. I didn't say it. <laughs> He's clear in his word that a person who loves the instruction of God loves to learn the ways of God. However, a person who hates correction is stupid. The word of God is counsel for life. Wisdom to teach us how to finish this journey 
in a way that will bring God glory. Amen. That's really. And you know what? If you're looking for glory for yourself, then you join the wrong camp. <laughs> yeah. Amen. If you're looking to glo for yourself to be glorified, you, we join the wrong camp. Lastly, wisdom to believe that God is the reason you prosper. I, I, the Lord just, I, I don't even know how this really fits in there. With the snare of the fowler, I guess, because I was talking, I guess I'm preaching to myself about dillards and pants. <laughs> but it can get a whole lot worse than a pair of pants from Dillard, right? Wisdom to believe that God is the reason you prosper. Proverbs 11:24. There is that scattereth and yet increases, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but tendeth to poverty. Let me just read it to you out of the ESV. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Wisdom to believe that God is the reason that you prosper. I don't think I can say that enough times. Wisdom to believe that God is the reason that you prosper. Amen. Sometimes we wonder why we never get ahead financially. And there are at least two reasons that we find ourselves unable to get ahead. I'm not talking about you ain't got no money. I'm not talking about the fact that, that you're not blessed of the Lord. There, there's two different situations that I'm talking about right here. One is that, you know what, you can be blessed of the Lord, but at the same time, you really ain't got what you ought to have. Two reasons. One is spiritual. The other one's practical. The spiritual one, we simply don't believe that the tithe belongs to God and we do what we want with it in spite of the fact that God says that when we do that, we're robbing from him. I didn't write the word. The tithe of God is put into the word of God. And I would do you a disservice. Actually, I was rebuked by Brother Larson a long time ago for not preaching more and talking more about tithing. He said, you're robbing your people of the blessing that belongs to them. Wow. So if you got a problem with it, take it up with Brother Larson. <laughs> Malachi 3.8 says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, where in have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You don't pick and choose what you want to do with your tithe. It belongs to God. And sometimes people make a choice that they're going to do what they want to do with their tithe. Listen, you can do whatever you want to do with your tithe. But what you really should do is you should get into the word of God and find out what God says to do with your tithe. I'm not going to tell you what his word says to do with your tithe. You get into the word of God and you find out what it says and you be led by the Lord. Amen. To do what it is. But I hope you're doing something with your tithe. At least be doing something with your tithe. Even if, even if you think that you're doing the right thing, at least you're doing something with it. And you're not going south with it in your own pocket that you bought with your new pair of pants from Dillard's. It's not yours. And it doesn't belong to you. I'm sorry it hurts. You don't believe that it's God that allows you to prosper to begin with. Amen. It's God that allows you to prosper. Listen to me. Do you remember where you used to be? Do you think it's God that allowed you to prosper? I don't mean to be rude, but some of you were in a jail cell. Amen. I was sitting on an air conditioner behind a convenience store waiting for somebody to drive up that I could smoke some of their pot. Didn't even have my own pot to smoke. <laughs> High school dropout without no hope. Only focused on a little bit more dope. But God turned it around. Hallelujah. God turned it around. He is the God that allowed me to prosper. And shut up, forget where my prosperity came from. Oh, but you don't understand, preacher. I got gifts and talents. Yeah, he gave them to you. And until he awakened them inside of you, they lay dormant. And they were only being used to do things according to the ways of the world. But God will allow those gifts and those talents to be awakened and spiritually begin to bless you. Open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not able, even able to contain. That's right. I'm talking about the snare of the fowler, man. He's going to get you caught up. It's a bait and trap. <laughs> Look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. 
but thou shalt remember the Lord your God. When I bring you into the promised land, when I bring you to the place where, the, where my promises are like prosperity that rain upon you, remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. Not nobody else. Not your boss. Oh, hopefully you got a good boss. Listen to me, Christian. Hopefully you got a good boss and that he's not withholding that which is rightfully yours. But don't forget that, that if God dries up his well, your well is going to get dried up too. God allowed you to be in a place where he could bless you. He put you in a place. Your prosperity is because of what he's done for you. It is he that gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto your fathers, as it is this day. Listen, it's very spiritual. Either number, we, we just, many times, we just don't believe that it was God that prospered us. I don't know about you, but I'm just not, I'm just too thick headed and I'm just too stubborn and I'm just too stupid to end up where I ended up today. And I realize that and I will give the Lord glory for that, that if it had not been for him leading and guiding me because I asked him to, Lord, please show me which way you would have me to go. And like a little pinball, boom, 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 just went in the right direction by his grace. Yes, yes. But I still need his grace today. Because it'll dry up, man. Because the well can dry up. God knows how to dry up a well. He knows how to create a famine in the land. Don't think that he doesn't because he's been in the business of doing it to get people's hearts right and to get their head right for a long, long time. So that's the first thing. Spiritually, we just don't believe that God is really the cause of our prosperity. So we don't. So we kind of make pick and choose what we're going to do with what belongs to him. Second part is practical. We refuse to use wisdom on the rest of the money that God has blessed us with. Look at this. Proverbs 12, 17, and I'm about to close. I'm sorry, Proverbs 21, 17. He that loves pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loves wine and oil shall not be rich. Listen to me. I'm not trying to act like, look, whoa, whoa. Trump likes Trump likes, yeah, Trump's a multi-billionaire. <laughs> and if he wants to fly in his private jet, he can fly in his private jet. What I'm trying to talk about, what the Bible's talking about right here is that people that think that they're richer than what they really are. People that are living in their life according to a facade, people that are living beyond their means. Mm -hmm. See, oil and wine cost money back in those days. And if you really love it and you consume it instead of saving it, you're never going to really be a wealthy person. The reality of it is, is that you need to learn how to live within your means, whatever your means are. Even if you're a multimillionaire, you still got some means. Why do you think Alan Iverson, well, I'm not going to say it the way my daddy used to, but he ain't got nothing left. He talking about how poor he is. He was a basketball player. He was worth multi-millions of dollars. They're talking about Johnny Depp, that he's got financial woes and bad situations going on in his life. Yeah, dude, you went, you bought an island and like... Britney Spears getting in a plane from California because there was a coffee shop that she liked in middle, Midwest America. So on a couple of times a week, if she wanted to, she'd just get in the jet to go get her a coffee. What? <laughs> My point being is, is that no matter how much money you have, you can live beyond your means. Now we act like, oh, that would never happen to me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Think about it. Did you ever think you'd spend money on some of the stuff that you've been frivolously spending money on today? There are times in our lives when we choose to overspend and live beyond our means for whatever reason, and it ultimately results in us having a lack rather than an abundance. My last point was called a place of protection from harm, but it's a place where one has to want to be. Where it talks about, I will hide you under the wings and feathers. I will hide you under my shield. Under, I will be a shield and a buckler unto you. You know, Jesus said this. This is real quick. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, how long I have desired to gather you under the wings like a mother hen desires to gather her chicks. But you would not have it. God is provide, wants to provide protection for his people, but many times we won't have it. Many times we don't want to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Don't let me forget that word almighty for a second. You know, in the book of Ruth, y'all remember the story of Ruth? I promise I'm closing with this thought. In the story of Ruth, it was providence. In other words, an act of God that allowed Ruth 
to even be introduced to the God of, the, of, of Israel, to the God of the Hebrew people. She was a Moabitess. She was a Moabite woman. She knew nothing about the Hebrew God. The God that she grew up knowing made their people offer a child sacrifice to worship him. But because of a famine in the land, God allowed, caused some of his people to venture away from Bethlehem into Moab. And one of these people's sons married her. Through that marriage, she was introduced to the God of the Hebrew people. And whenever the famine was over, by that time, her husband had died. Her father-in-law had died. And there were two sister-in-laws. And the other sister-in-law was ended up going back to her family. But Ruth said, no, I'm going to be your God's going to be my God and your people's going to be my people. She went back over there, and as God began to bless her, she didn't understand really what was happening. And Boaz, who, was ble who God used as an instrument to bless her, said in Ruth 2.12, The Lord recompense your work, Ruth, <laughs> and a full reward be given you of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you are come to trust. She didn't know anything about the ways of God, but hallelujah, somebody introduced her to God and she made a decision to live her life for God. Listen, God has a place of protection. He has a place where he wants to hide us under the shadow of his wing. Naya, you can come play us a song. He has a place where he wants to hide us under the shadow of his wings. But guess what? You got to want to be there. Amen. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. For how long I've wanted to bring you under the shadow of my wings. just like a mothering hen takes care of her chicks. But you would not have it. They missed their day of visitation when Jesus showed up. Listen, I know one thing about everybody here this morning. And I believe it with all of my heart. And even some people that couldn't make it this morning. That deep down in their heart, they want to live for the Lord. We don't always get everything right because God's people don't, never always get everything right. But I will tell you this. I know that because you're here this morning, you want to live for the Lord. You may not even completely understand what all that means right now. But what you want to do is you want to live for the Lord. Amen.